Trouble finding that stone to <laughs>
Vidyantov. Vidyantov. Are you able to hear me all right in the back there, Alan? Glad to be here with everybody. Uh, those who stay through the entire arc start to feel a mixture of euphoria and exhaustion uh, at this point in the afternoon on Yom Kippur, which is exactly the moment that the best stuff can happen. A lot of you are regulars at Avodat Halev. So what I'm about to describe is uh, obvious to you. Others have not taken advantage of that service, and maybe you'll choose to, or maybe this will prove to you why you haven't. But <laughs> there is a style of worship that is inherent in Judaism, built into our tradition, that uses liturgy. We are, after all, a liturgical rite. But does away with what's known as the matbea tefillah, the, the strict uh, formulaic uh, rigidity of the service. In that space, when you have a bunch of like-minded people and the music encourages it, and the whole situation facilitates the possibility, then the singing can do some remarkable things. You'll notice there's a lot of repetition in the songs. The idea being that hopefully if you don't know them, after one or two sing-throughs, you will. And then, that's when the good stuff happens. That's when you can settle back and close your eyes. You're not going to need a machzor for the service. You can put it on a seat next to you or under the seat in front of you or something. All the, the words and the prayers will be up on the screen behind me. Um, and we're going to utilize the the Torah and Haftarah readings today as an anchor that takes us through the, the elements of the service and in between each we'll pause and we'll utilize a prayer to emphasize the energy or the theme that comes to us from that material. So, nope. Oh, oh Amitai's already on it. Excellent, dude. Hello, hi, neshama. On Yom Kippur, what a beautiful reminder. It says, God, despite what my behavior would suggest, despite what others might say about me or see of me, despite my own, uh, my own uncertainty, I'm here to remind you and myself that the soul that you put inside me, the neshama, is tahorah. Is pure. My God, the soul that you placed in me is pure. Shinatata be 
Using, using liturgy for mixed purposes is a great privilege of being a progressive community. It's also a great responsibility because it means that we have to actually engage with the material to make sure we know what we're saying and that we're employing it in this new function in an authentic way. And so, Instead of doing the same liturgy we've been doing all series of holidays with Kim Yitzion and Shema and Lacha, we used a blessing saying this right here. This is pure. And when we take the Torah out into the world, the human holding it is pure. And the humans that are about to read it are pure. And when we receive its teaching with all seriousness, with all gravitas intended, then we too will be pure. So, we're going to have two aliyahs for Torah. I'd like to invite up two different groups. Um, the first group, this is not the best moment for us to do it. Maybe we'll readjust for next year, but our ushers. Throughout the series of our holidays, they are just so important. Those of you who've chosen to step out of the service and give up your own experience in important ways so that others know where to go, are made to feel welcome, can't sneak in without a ticket. All of those things you do as ushers, they are so beautiful. And so we want to just say thank you. There are others who aren't here anymore. They've done their ushering piece another time of the, the holidays, but we'll be honoring them with this Aaliyah as well. Would all the ushers from any of the services, come forward for this aliyah. The first aliyah is going to be read by Terry Newman. Boy, that's a lot of ushers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry about the guitar. I left my toys lying around. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah, you'll direct them away. Yam do la lia rishona. Baruch Atah Adonai, 
Amen. Fayadaber Adonai, El Moshe Le Mohor, Dahaber, El Koadat, Bene Israel, Beamarta Alehem, Kadoshim, Tehiu, Ki Kadosh, Ani Adonai Elohechem, Ish Imoho, Viaviv, Tirahu viet shabbatotai tishmeru anihi adonai elohechem al tifnu el ha elilim viale vialohe masecha lo taasu lachem anihi adonai elohechem vehi tisba Hu zevach shalamim ladonai l'ritzonechem tizbehu hu bayam bayam zivchachem yaachel yeachel umimachorat v'hanotara v'hanotar ad yom hashlishi. Between Aliyahs, we're going to pause, and we're going to use a, a, a setting that Shefa Gold wrote to Ozi Vizimrat Yah. We just read in the Torah about what being holy looks like. And I'm going to go ahead and flip the slide. And this, this piece talks about how we can't do it ourselves. Before the, the afternoon service, we were talking over in the, the chapel about what it looks like to be partners with the universe, to take strength from the source of all strength. So let's acknowledge that none of us is what we are without being a part of the whole.
those who are newcomers to Avodat HaLev, which means, by the way, the labor of the heart, the work, the effort. Avodah is a wonderful choice because it's also a, a word that's a euphemism for prayer. So Avodah Shabalev, uh, or Avodat HaLev, is the work that our heart does. And when we do that, it is by nature, by definition, prayer. Amy Lillian Harper is going to read our second aliyah for us. And um, I was thinking that I would invite up any of you who plan to stay for Kaddish in, uh, in Yisker. If you've come thinking about a parent or a sibling or a child or a partner, someone who you plan to honor in the Yisker service after this, and you'd like to arise in their memory, in their honor for Kaddish, I invite you to come up and do that as well now. Ya amdu laliashniha. Shlishi v'guhu lo yiratze v'elchelav avono yisa ki akodesh adonai chilel v'nichreta hanefesh hahi me'ameha uvkutrechem et kitzir artzechem lo techale Pa'atzarecha leek tzor, v'leke kitzirecha v'tilaket, v'charmecha lo t'olel, u'feret karmecha lo t'laket, l'ani v'lager ta'azov o'tam, ani Adonai Eloheichem, lo t'ignovu, Velo techachashu, velo tishakeru, ishba amito, velo tishave uvishmi la shaker, vechilelta, etche melo hecha, ani adonai. If you haven't already, and if you care to, you can stop by on this side and just take a rock from the basket, and in memory and honor of your loved one, you can place it in the bowl as a, an ongoing memorial for that soul. Thank you, everyone, and I appreciate you being up here.
start Jonah. It's the Haftarah for this afternoon, and before we do, we're going to use the, a, a new setting to us of, um, of the 150th Psalm. Uh, Joey Weissenberg put it to this melody, and we chose it for this spot because the, the, the refrain is, Kol han shema to halal ya, everything that breathes praises God. And this story of Jonah is about the, the diversity and the inherent value a part of every element of the world, from the worm to the gourd to the individuals of Nineveh and even the fish. All of it, while breathing, praises God. And the word of Adonai came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh, and proclaim against it, for their evil deeds have risen up against me. But Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish, away from the presence of Adonai, and he went down to Jaffa and found there a ship headed for Tarshish. And he paid its fare and went down into it, to head with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of Adonai. But Adonai hurled a great wind upon the sea, a storm at sea so great that the ship was in danger of being shattered to pieces. And the sailors were frightened. They cried out, each to his own god, and they flung the ship's cargo into the sea to lighten their load. But Jonah had gone down into the hold the lower deck of the vessel, and he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain approached him and said to him, What are you doing sound asleep? Get up! Call to your God! 
Perhaps the God will be kind to us and we will not perish. And they said, each man to his companion, let us cast lots. And the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, tell us, you who have brought this evil upon us, what is your trade? And where have you come from? What's your country? And who are your people? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I revere Adonai, God of heaven, who made sea and dry land. The men felt great fear, and they asked him, What have you done? Because the men knew he was fleeing from Adonai, for so he had told them. And they asked him, What should we do to you to bring calm to the sea around us? For the sea was growing more and more stormy. So he said to them, Lift me up and hurl me into the sea, and the sea will calm down for you. For I know that this great storm came upon you because of me. And the crew rowed hard to return to dry land. But they could not do it, for the sea was raging more and more fiercely around them. And they called out to Adonai, saying, Please, Adonai, do not let us perish because of the life of this man. And do not hold us guilty of shedding innocent blood. For you, Adonai, that which you desired, you've brought about. And they lifted Jonah, and they hurled him into the sea. And then the sea stopped raging, and the men revered Adonai. Great was their reverence. And so they offered to Adonai a sacrifice, and they made vows. The piece we're going to use at this point is Shiviti, which sings about how you can look any direction, but no matter where you turn, there you'll find God. Shiviti Adonai Lenegdi Tamid. I place God just opposite me, no matter where I look. Jonah could not hide. Everywhere he went, there was God.
imagine Jonah's fear. Imagine the terror as he's sinking down into the sea. And Adonai provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah prayed to Adonai, his God, from the belly of the fish. And he said, I called to Adonai in my distress, and God answered me. I cried out from the belly of the netherworld, and you heard my voice. Into the depths you cast me, into the heart of the sea, and the floods engulfed me. All your billowing, breaking waves swept over me. And I thought to myself, I will banish from before your eyes. I was banished from before your eyes. Will I ever again gaze upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep engulfed me, rushes wrapped around my head. I descended to the low point of the mountains. The gates of the earth closed upon me forever. Yet you, Adonai, my God, raised up my life from the pit. When my life fainted away, I called Adonai to mind, and my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. They who cling to empty folly forsake their own welfare. But I, with a shout of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will fulfill. Rescue comes from Adonai. Adonai commanded the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon dry land. Imagine the fear. Jonah is certain that this is his end. He has no reason to expect that there is another chapter to his story. And yet at that moment, it's at just that moment that he submits, realizing that fear is going to be a part of his story, and says, I give. And what was on the other side of that fear, quite remarkable.
the word of Adonai came to Jonah a second time. Get up. Go to the great city of Nineveh and call out to it the proclamation that I tell you. So Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the word of Adonai. Now, Nineveh was a great city of God, three days' journey across. And Jonah started out and made his way into the city the distance of a one-day walk. And he called out and said, Forty more days, and Nineveh shall be overturned. The people of Nineveh trusted in God, and they proclaimed a fast, and they put on sackcloth from the richest to the poorest. And word reached the king of Nineveh, and he got up from his throne, took off his robe, put on sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he cried out, And said in Nineveh, by decree of the king and his nobles, no person or beast of flock or herd shall taste anything. They shall not graze, and they shall not drink water. They shall be covered with sackcloth, person and beast, and shall call loudly to God. Let all turn back from their evil ways and from the violence which is in their hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent, turn back from the heart of anger, so that we do not perish. God saw what they did, how they were turning back from their evil ways, and God relented from the evil planned for them and did not carry it out. You know, no matter how bad it can get, that pure heart at the core of us is reliable. We can find it. All we need to do is close our eyes and look inward, and we'll find it gleaming back towards us. A pure heart. my favorite part. But to Jonah, this was a great evil, and it made him angry. So we prayed to Adonai, saying, please, Adonai, is this not what I said when I was still in my own country? This is why I fled to Tarshish to begin with. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, endlessly patient and abounding in steadfast love, ready to repent of evil. And now, Adonai, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And Adonai said, is it good for you to be angry? Then Jonah left the city, found a place east of the city, made himself a shelter there, and sat under it in the shade until he might see what would become of the city. And Adonai Elohim provided a gourd and made it rise up over Jonah to give shade for his head and rescue him from his evil situation. 
And Jonah rejoiced with great joy because of the gourd. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm that attacked the gourd, and it withered. And as the sun rose, God provided an oppressive wind from the east, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head, making him faint. He begged for death, saying, It is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, Are you good and angry about the gourd? And he said, I am good and angry to the point of death. Then Adonai said, You pitied the gourd which you neither worked for nor grew, which appeared overnight and perished overnight. Should I then not have compassion for the great city of Nineveh, a place of more than 120,000 human beings, unable to tell their right hand from their left, and many beasts? The, the challenge for Jonah was to accept the notion that he had a role to play in Nineveh. All he saw were strangers, and all he wanted, frankly, was their destruction. What he was being shown by God was that you can't pull the pieces apart. If you're going to value any piece of the puzzle, then you've got to appreciate the whole. And when Jonah realizes this, if Jonah should get to that point, we don't know. When he realizes this, then he'll see Nineveh, and with chesed, he'll appreciate them. He may even offer guidance and support. He may roll up his sleeves and work to help Nineveh achieve that improvement of condition. What we can take from the story of Jonah is that without our participation, it won't be possible to build an olam of chesed, a world where compassionate care and concern is the primary energy. Let's imagine that Jonah is off on a hillside and that we can sing to him the truth of these words, serenade that short-sighted individual Help him connect to the idea of an olam chesed.
become our minhag, our tradition at Avodat HaLev on Shabbat morning to close out our service with singing Od Yavo Shalom Aleinu. And I, I think it is perfectly appropriate this afternoon as well because the, the words as created by Sheva speak about how peace will come to us, but then after singing Shalom, they add on salam, because we can't enjoy peace if we know that the other doesn't. And Jonah was sent off to work with a city of Ninevites who were not Israelite. They were not our kin, but they needed help. They needed a partner. And Jonah ultimately said, Hineni, and did it. So where are your opportunities to bring shalom into the world. It will yet come, but only if we join the effort. The day's energy is beginning to turn. Got a little more ahead of us yet. Some of the hardest, in fact. Avodad Halev is designed as an opportunity to rest and to open oneself spiritually. We're constantly experimenting. Be interested to know your thoughts about this experiment after the holidays are over. It was never going to be just like we do on Shabbat morning. But I wonder whether you were able to find any moments of peace, any beauty, any new way of experiencing Yom Kippur using this material. We'll take just a, a minute to reset the bima before we move on into our Yisker service. If you need to stand up and stretch, now is a good opportunity.
can go in the back. This one. This service is the one you chose to sit yourself up. Hey, I'm so glad. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I need help with your name. Say it again. Sophia. <laughs> Rabbi Jay. Thank you. I appreciate that, that expression. And thank you. It was a nice service. Brad beat me to the bathroom. Bye. What's that? Bye. Bye. Oh, no. I'm still getting ready to the next <laughs> Yeah, I got it. I understand. I understood.
Have a, a list of lighters? of you who are in the room with us at this point are here for the shared experience of having lost someone powerfully important. Somebody filled a role in your life and their absence has never been filled. It will never be filled. And so we provide opportunities to come together like this and to acknowledge that you now walk through the world with a hole in your, in your soul. And others do as well. There's a deep camaraderie for those who choose to be a part of Yiskor. In some way, 
we are saying to each other, I feel it too. Our tradition at Sinai is that during this afternoon service, we provide the opportunity, the invitation, for anybody who would care to, to make their way up and to spend some time behind us, behind me, at the ark. Sure we are. In individuals or partners, ones and twos, parents, kids, however you might choose to do so. My invitation is this. At some point in the next hour or so, if the idea appeals to you, quietly make your way over to this side here, stand next to Frank. And when there's no one standing here, just make your way up. Spend as long as you want. When you're done, you'll head off the bima to my right. And if you'd like to pause on the way off, you'll be able to light uh, uh, a tea light in memory of, in honor of your loved one. If you don't care to come stand at the, at the Aron HaKodesh, that's fine. If you just want to find a moment, something in the service speaks to you and you think, now's the moment, then that's when you stand up and you make your way to this side and you light the candle. Some of you have been invited or have accepted the offer, I guess. We invited uh, the whole congregation. Some of you have accepted the invitation to light a candle as part of the service. Uh, I think Betsy has that organized, and you, I think, know when you'll head on up here to do so. But for now, let's open up uh, the page to 541. And though it is our tradition that when the Aron is open, we stand, there are exceptions to that tradition. And this is one of them. So I'm going to open up the ark doors to allow for you to make your way forward when you're ready. And we're going to keep our seats. Eternal God, we ask your help. For our need is great. Our days fly past in quick succession and we cannot look back without regret or ahead without misgiving. We seek to understand the mystery of our own lives, but our effort is in vain. And when suffering and death strike those we love, our faith all but fails us and we forget that we are your children. God, help us now to feel your presence. When our own weaknesses and the storms of life hide you from our sight, help us to know that you are with us still. Uphold us with the comfort of your love. On page 546, this is an explanation of how the service is constructed. The traditional Yiskor prayer asks God to remember the souls of our loved ones and to shelter them for eternity. But the Yisker service on Yom Kippur has significance beyond the prayer itself. This is a moment set apart for solitary reflection, an opportunity to fulfill a sacred obligation, and it's a time to feel the physical and emotional closeness of community, the presence of other people who know what we've been through because they have been through their version too. At Yisker, we see the sorrow in one another's eyes. And as the number seven is a Jewish symbol of wholeness and holiness, our Yisker service offers seven ways to reflect on loss and memory, grief and healing. We choose alone and together from among these diverse lights. And so we're going to be going through one at a time each of our seven candles, but first on page 546.
on page 549. We begin the first candle. The death of a loved one is the most profound of all sour sorrows. The grief that comes with such a loss is intense and multifaceted, affecting our emotions, our bodies, and our lives. Grief is preoccupying and depleting. Emotionally, grief is a mixture of raw feelings such as sorrow, anguish, anger, regret, longing, fear, deprivation. Grief may be experienced physically as exhaustion, emptiness, tension, sleeplessness, or loss of appetite. Grief invades our daily lives in many sudden gaps and changes, like that empty place at the dinner table or that sudden loss of affection and companionship, as well as in many new apprehensions, adjustments, and uncertainties. The loss of a loved one throws every aspect of our lives out of balance. The closer we were to the person who died, the more havoc the loss creates. Love does not die quickly. Hence, to grieve is also to celebrate the depth of the union. Tears are then the jewels of remembrance, sad but glistening with the beauty of the past. And so grief in its bitterness marks the end, but it also is praise to the one who is gone. On 553. Move to the front of the line, a voice says. And suddenly, there's nobody. There's nobody left standing between you and the world to take the first blows on their shoulders. This is the place in books where one part ends and part two begins, and there is no part three. The slate is wiped, but not clean rather like a canvas, painted over in white so that a whole new landscape must be started. Bits of the old still showing underneath, those colors sadness lends to a certain hour of the evening. Now the line of light at the horizon is the hinge between earth and heaven, only visible a few moments as the sun drops its rusted padlock into place. Page 554, I'll invite the first candle lighter to come forward. In the middle of the page, blessed are those who give meaning to our lives. Holy and precious is the example they leave behind. Together we pray, may our sorrows diminish as we recall their strength. May their wisdom protect us and help us to live. Let our grief be transformed into tenderness toward those who are still with us. Baruch Ata Adonai, Makor HaChaim, blessed are you, Holy One, who gives and renews life. Adam lah 
This second candle on inner strength and survival. On page 559. Do not grieve for me too much. I'm a spirit confident of my rights. Death is only an incident and not the most important which happens to us in this state of being. On the whole, Especially since I met you, my darling one, I have been happy. And you've taught me how noble a woman's heart can be. If there is anywhere else, I shall be on the lookout for you. Meanwhile, look forward. Feel free. Rejoice in life. Cherish the children. And guard my memory. God bless you. On page 560. What are my sources of inner strength? How have I survived loss and its pain? Where do I find green pastures and still waters? Blessed is the life force within us, even in the worst of times. Like dew on the grass, it renews and restores. We pray together, may courage come. Let dark fears be gone with morning's light. Let grief give way to confidence and to new hope. Baruch Ata Adonai, Mekor HaChayim. Blessed are you, holy God, who gives and renews life. On page 563, we move into the third candle, candle for the holiness of memory. I needed to talk to my sister, talk to her on the telephone. I mean, just as I used to, every morning. In the evening, too, whenever the grandchildren said a sentence that clasped both our hearts, I called. Her phone rang four times. You can imagine my breath stopped. And then there was a terrible telephonic noise. A voice said, this number is no longer in use. How wonderful, I thought. I can call again, and they have not yet assigned her number to another person, despite two years of absence due to death. On page 566, our third candle lighter, Towards the bottom of the page, blessed are the memories, holy and cherished the love they reveal. 
we pray, our sorrows soften and diminish in strength. May the pains of past bereavements grow gentler with time. Let memory bring us nearer to the love of our ones in our midst. Baruch Ata Adonai, Mikor HaChaim. Blessed are you, Holy One, who gives and who renews life. This piece, Yihiyu, is intended now for you to use the next bit of time for yourselves. The fourth candle on 567 is about our most precious relationships. And while it's being delivered, you can flip the page and see on the blue, I don't know, spread, just some of the examples of words that might be in your heart. I remember, I wish, I mourn, I'm grateful. And for the people who might fill the second half of that sentence, for my companion, my grandchild, my sister-in-law, my daughter. The next several pages have special, specific Yisker versions, and I invite you to find the one that speaks most to your need and to offer it with the name of your loved one right where the ellipses are found in the text. I'm going to suggest that for the moment, those who haven't yet joined the line for the ark, just stay seated for a little bit. In a few minutes, we'll have a sermon, and after the sermon, you can rejoin the line. Those of you who are in line, stay right there. There'll be plenty of time for everybody who cares to, to experience that. For the moment, we're going to continue now on page 578. Blessed is the life of every soul, pure and bright, the breath of God within us. We pray together. Help, Help us, us know the infinite wisdom that, that gives life and, and takes it away. Forgive, forgive us for anger, anger bitterness, bitterness, and selfishness. selfishness. Teach, Teach us the language of healing. Baruch atah Adonai, mikor hachaim. Blessed are you, Holy One, who gives and renews life. On 581. Forgiveness and the afterlife. I do have an ongoing relationship with the dead, and I do think about the afterlife. My afterlife, that is, after someone I know dies. What happens to me afterwards in my life? Some deaths come too soon. Some deaths are unexpected. Some deaths we think we are prepared for, but really we are rarely ready. We don't usually know when a conversation is the last conversation, with so much that may be left unsaid, unresolved. So in this afterlife of mine, 
I am still in relationship with people who have died. I miss them. I talk to them in my mind. I ask them questions about our relationship that I wasn't ready to ask them when they were still alive. I show off my accomplishments and wish they could witness them. And yes, I still have some of the same old arguments, still trying to prove my point of view. What helps me go forward? How do I resolve these lingering feelings? Here is what makes the Yom Kippur Yizkor so special. This forgiveness prayer devoted exclusively to those no longer with us that comes late in the afternoon when we are tired, hungry, vulnerable, and open. During this Yizkor, I am given the opportunity to forgive myself for cutting off that last phone conversation with my father. I was always in a hurry. He wanted always to chat longer. And then he died. It's during this year's core that I have the opportunity to forgive my mother for her harsh ways, to let go of being angry for my sake in this world, if not for her sake in the world to come. For this year's core to feel honest and meaningful, I don't want to sentimentalize those relationships. I don't just want to remember the ideals and gifts they may or may not have passed down. I want to remember those relationships exactly as they were, and then be able to forgive myself and them for our failings, for what we never got a chance to repair or finish. Page 583. Page 584. Blessed is this path that we are hopefully on, the path to acceptance. Very near and sometimes distant as the horizon, we pray together that our moments of joy surpass the times of struggle, that we taste the sweetness of each precious day, that the work of our hands brings fulfillment. Baruch atah Adonai mekor hachayim. Blessed are you, Holy One, who gives and renews life. On page 585. If some messenger 
were to come to us with the offer that death should be overthrown, but with the one inseparable condition that birth should also cease. If the existing generation were given the chance to live forever, but on the clear understanding that never again would there be a child or a youth or a first love, never again new persons with new hopes, new ideas, new achievements, ourselves for always and never any others, could the answer be in doubt? When we fear death's decree, let these bring us solace, the memory of loved ones who have gone before us, a vision of generations to come, through whom we reach far into the future, beyond our own lives. This sixth candle is a candle on gratitude for the wonderful elements that have been ours along the way. We'll read responsively on page 586. If life is a pilgrimage, then death is an arrival, a celebration. The last word should be neither craving nor bitterness, but rather gratitude and peace. Together, we have been, been given, given so much. much. Why, Why is the outcome of our lives, the sum of our achievements, so, so little? little? Our embarrassment is like an abyss. Whatever we give away is so much less than what we receive. Perhaps this is the meaning of dying, to give one's whole self away. Death is the end of what we can do as God's partners in redemption. The life that follows must be earned while we're here. It does not come out of nothing. It is an ingathering, the harvest of eternal moments achieved while on earth. Unless we cultivate sensitivity to the glory while we are here, unless we learn how to experience a foretaste of heaven while on earth, what can there be in store for us in the life to come? The seed of life eternal is planted within us here and now, but a seed is wasted when placed on stone into souls that die while the body is still alive. How can I repay the eternal for all God's bountiful gifts to me? When life is an answer, then death is a homecoming. The deepest, deepest wisdom we can attain is to know that our destiny is to aid and to serve. This is the meaning of death, the ultimate self-dedication to the divine. Death so understood will not be distorted by the craving for immortality, for this act of giving away is reciprocity on our part for God's gift of life. For the pious, the pious person, person, it is a privilege, privilege to die. die. 589. You, today, you would have been 97 if you had lived, and we would all be miserable. You and your children driving from clinic to clinic, an ancient, fearful hypochondriac and his fretful son and daughter asking directions, trying to read the complicated, fading maps of cures. But with your dignity intact, you've been gone for 20 years, and I'm glad for all of us although I miss you every day. The heartbeat under your necktie, the hand cupped on the back of my neck, old spice in the air, your voice delighted with stories. On this day each year, you loved to relate that at the moment of your birth, your mother glanced out the window and saw lilacs in bloom. Well, today, lilacs are blooming in side yards all over Iowa, still welcoming you. On page 591, blessed is that pilgrimage from grief to gratitude. Precious are the sights along the way we pray together for, for humility, humility to, to see, see in, in all things the great artist of eternity, eternity. For, for generosity to respond to the gift of life by, by giving of ourselves, ourselves. For, for strength to hold on, on to life, life and let to let go. it go. Baruch Ata Adonai, Mekor HaChayim. Blessed are you, Holy One, who gives and renews life. And on page 593, we have the 23rd Psalm, and um, we'll first deliver it in Hebrew, and then, uh, and then we'll translate.
594 and 5, you'll find four different translations of the 23rd Psalm. Many of you will be familiar with number one. I'm going to read number three. It is interesting to see the variety of ways to approach the text. All of them are pretty faithful translations. The Shekhinah, a sheltering presence, makes me whole causing me to rest in green fields, leading me to calming waters, replenishing my soul, and empowering me to make life-affirming choices in celebration of God's name. Even though I have walked in darkness and known loss, I have not despaired, for you are with me. Your guidance and your nurturing spirit have sustained me. You've set a full table for me when I've been hurt and alienated. You've conferred upon me unique potential, which I strive to realize from the deep core of my being. I am overflowing with gratitude. I know that your goodness and loving kindness will continue to abide with me, and I will live out my days 
in God's house. On page 596, Blessed is peace, for all blessings flow from it. Precious is peace, for without it no blessing is complete. We pray together for, for inner, inner serenity, serenity, for, for peace, peace of mind, mind for, for the, the feeling of at-homeness in the universe, universe and in our hearts. Baruch atah Adonai, mekor hachayim. Blessed are you, Holy One, who gives and renews life. Listen to the sounds around you carefully when you talk in your heart into the phone of the wind. For my birthday this past winter, my husband Ben handed me a small, unassuming book called The Phone Booth at the Edge of the World and said to me simply, for your Yisker sermon. How lucky am I to have a partner who anticipates my needs before I know them myself? It wasn't until months later that I truly understood the gift I had been given. This summer, after a year of personal upheaval and turmoil, I finally had the opportunity to sit down and begin reading the quiet little book covered in pink cherry blossoms. It is a love story, a work of fiction, but based on an actual place and real events. It is a story about love and loss and the strength and connection that blooms from fragility and vulnerability. We are here today, fragile and vulnerable. We are broken and we weep for the cracks in our hearts. We sit in this space together because we seek a salve for the wound of our losses. Some of our loved ones have been gone for decades, some more recently departed. Some died at ripe old age and some were taken from us far too soon. For some, the memories are sweet and uncomplicated and for others fraught with struggle and challenge. But whatever our relationship was with them in life, we are here today hoping to somehow sit a bit closer to them, to reach out to them and feel them reaching back towards us. On this day of zichronot, of memories, we beckon their souls nearer and whisper words of blessing and comfort to them and to each other. And in these moments of silence, we listen for the still, small voice of their response. Our tradition offers this Yiz Kor service as a beautiful ritual that can bring healing and comfort in the face of our loss. But perhaps there are more layers we can add to enrich our experience this Yiz Kor. In the spirit of this year's theme of DIY Judaism, do-it-yourself Judaism, we're continuing to bring innovation and imagination into the space of our mourning. Already this season, Rabbi Jay has introduced the new tradition of adding stones of memory to Betsy Stone's beautiful ceramic bowl. Each stone represents a soul, and much like we place small rocks on the gravestones of our loved ones, the pebbles are tangible reminders of those whom we have loved and lost. But now I'd like to share with you a powerful new tool that with open hearts and open minds might evolve our spiritual connection with our lost loved ones even further. Many of us are familiar with Jewish death and burial rites. We attend Jewish funerals. We sit Shiva at the homes of bereaved friends and family. We say Kaddish and light yard site candles. But I'd wager that only a few of us have spent time thinking about how our mourning rites connect us to our loved ones beyond death. How does Judaism address the living's ongoing relationship with the dead? 
believe it or not, there exists a Jewish ghost story that seeks to explain the origins of the Kaddish prayer and sheds light on the subject. It goes like this. One night, Rabbi Akiva was strolling through the graveyard and encountered the ghost of a man forced to carry armloads of wood for all eternity because he had sinned during his lifetime and had no one alive to atone for him. Rabbi Akiva, dismayed at this poor man's fate, went off and found the man's bastard son, circumcised him, and taught him to recite the words, Yehei Shemei Rabbah Mevorach. Sure enough, with these words, his father's soul was redeemed and the man was freed from his Sisyphean punishment. Afterwards, the man came to Rabbi Akiva in a dream and thanked him for enabling his soul to ascend to heaven. A few weeks before Rosh Hashanah, I dreamed of my maternal grandmother. In my dream, I was walking around in an unfamiliar house. I descended a flight of stairs and saw a woman, her back to me, setting a table. The woman turned around and I saw it was my grandmommy, Adeline. She beamed at me, took me in her arms and said, it's so good to see you. And that was it. I awoke bittersweet tears on my cheeks. Since then, I've been thinking about Adeline. What was the reason for her visit? Is there some wisdom I need to receive from her? Or is there something that I'm supposed to share with her? Our dream encounter was so brief, but her presence lingers in my mind. I knew there was more we both needed to express. For some, ongoing dialogue with those who have departed this world might seem natural and thus come easily. Maybe you talk to your mother or father on your drive home from work and tell them about your day. Maybe you speak to your friend when you're wrestling with a difficult decision or you have exciting news you want to share. Or maybe you need to walk out in nature or step into this sanctuary to feel close to those who are gone. More likely, there are words we yearn to share, but struggle to find outlet and release in our daily lives. A bottleneck of expression lodged painfully in our chests, yearning to break forth. The Telephone of the Wind, upon which the book, The Phone Booth at the Edge of the World was based, was created in 2010 by Itaru Sazaki as a response to the pain of losing his beloved cousin to cancer. In his grief, Sasaki purchased an old black rotary telephone and placed it in his garden. And though it was not connected to any earthly communication system, he began using the phone to continue speaking to his cousin. Picking up the U-shaped receiver, holding it to his ear and mouth, dialing the numbers one at a time, and then allowing the words to flow out. Using this tangible object, he remained connected to his cousin and found comfort and healing. The following year, an earthquake of enormous magnitude caused a tsunami that obliterated the coast of Japan, destroying entire towns and taking thousands of lives. Countless souls were swept out to sea by the 30-foot waves crashing to shore, and their bodies were never recovered. The city of Otsuchi suffered the highest number of missing persons, and its survivors were awash in a sea of grief and loss. In the aftermath, Sazaki was able to salvage his wind phone and relocated it to the blustery hill overlooking the Pacific Ocean next to the town of Otsuchi. He welcomed mourners to visit his phone booth and encouraged them to make calls to their friends and relatives lost to the great tsunami. He hoped that like him, they would find connection and hope and thus ease some of the pain of their grief. For thousands of mourners from all over the world, speaking into the phone of the wind has become an incredibly powerful mourning ritual 
sparking resilience in the face of loss. Mourners make the pilgrimage to call their loved ones in spirit, to say the things they didn't get a chance to say in life. The wind phone and surrounding gardens are a sacred place that provides solace to the bereaved as they work through the pain of their loss. As a result, the phone of the wind has inspired the creation of many similar spaces all over the world. After I finished the novel Ben had given me, read more about the real life phone of the wind and subsequent wind phones that have sprung up all over the globe, I decided that Temple Sinai needed a wind phone of its own. With Sharon Goldstein's blessing, we purchased an old black rotary phone from eBay, found a comfortable outdoor chair, and engraved a special guest book for visitors to sign and leave reflections. Everything is ready to go and in place up on the steps behind at the back of the atrium. Ultimately, it will be outside, but we didn't think anyone would want to go out on a day like today. But how could I stand here today and encourage you to try out our new wind phone if I myself had not yet placed a call? It took me weeks to muster the courage to use the phone. I knew I wanted to speak to my grandmother, Adeline, who had visited me in my dream. But I felt really self-conscious and I didn't know what I should say. When I was finally ready, well, not ready, but I decided it was time. I sat there with the phone in my hand, not knowing how to proceed. Eventually, I picked up the receiver and said, hello, grandmommy, it's me, Micah. I immediately started to cry. Through my tears, I began telling her about my children, her great grandchildren whom she never got to meet. I told her up about Ben and how much she would love him. I told her that my mom, her older daughter, had been very ill, but that she's doing much better now. And how we lived with my aunt, her younger daughter, during our home renovations this past year. I thanked her for having two incredibly strong daughters. Then I sat in silence for a bit suddenly feeling a bit foolish because she probably knew all of this already, right? Hasn't she been out there somewhere watching all along? What could I possibly say to her that she didn't already know? But I took a deep breath and continued. I thanked her for the gifts she's given me, passed down through generations. An uncanny knack for bargain shopping an ability and passion for crafting all manner of beautiful little things. And of course, a love of music and singing. I was quiet for a bit longer, the phone still to my ear. And then I just said, I love you. I ended the call and sat for a long time looking out over the landscape, tears spilling down my cheeks, so grateful for the opportunity to say aloud what I'd been holding in my heart. For me, calling my grandmother on the wind phone was a powerful reminder that our loved ones are with us always, surrounding us, enfolding us, a palpable energy pulsing through our every breath, present with every heartbeat. Even in the moments when we experience the pain of their absence, they are also present. In our missing them, we feel them still. As with God, there is no place we can go where our loved ones are not. The wind phone gives space to honor this truth with the sacred dialogue. If we but choose to listen, they are always speaking. There's still small voices advising us, guiding us. And in turn, I believe they listen for us, for our cries of help, our words of yearning, our expressions of gratitude, our hurts, our hopes, our fears, 
our loves. And so let's speak the words of our hearts into the wind phone. It's waiting for us just out back by the atrium. There's a comfortable seat, the old rotary telephone, and a guest registry. The setting and the phone invite stillness and slowness. Soak in the silence as you gather your thoughts and set your intention. With whom do you wish to speak? What do you need to say? Or what message do you need to receive? When you pick up the phone, gently place it to your ear, dial the number, any series of numbers will do. When you are ready, begin speaking. Share the words you need to say to whomever. Listen in your heart for the response you are seeking. And when you are done, hang up the phone. The wind phone invites us to let go of judgment, open ourselves to possibility, and it welcomes us to tap into the threads of connection that have been there all along, just hidden from our conscious ear. With open hearts and open minds, we can access the messages of the universe that swirl around us always, and we can consider the endless possibilities of expression, interconnectedness, and healing. In so doing, our Temple Sinai wind phone joins our other morning rituals and becomes a powerful tool for coping with loss, communicating with God and our loved ones, and maybe even better understanding ourselves. In this way, may our hearts be healed, may our faith be deepened, and our memories be lifted up for blessing and carried off on the wind. Gamarto. I only feel committed to make sure that I give Betsy credit for the idea of the stones. It's not just her bowl. El Malay Rachamim is a an expression, it's a request. It is us putting out there into the universe the hope that as we cared for our loved ones and they cared for us, that now that they have moved on, they are being cared for to the level we would have wanted to do ourselves. El Malay Rachamim is an opportunity for us, more than Kaddish, to articulate the names, to say them, to put them back out into the universe as more than just an idea in our head. In a moment, we're going to offer El Malay Rachamim. I also, by the way, invite those of you who wanted to and haven't had a chance to come up to the Ark to resume that process. But I'm going to, I'm going to have you think now about the people for whom you're reciting El Malay Rachamim. In a moment, I'm going to invite you to rise. And then we're going to begin the delivery of El Malay Rachamim and pause for a, a moment in the middle for you to then speak those words aloud, just like we do in the traditional El Malay. This one's a more modern version, but it seeks to do the exact same thing. If you're able, would you please be upstanding? <clears throat> Ha <laughs> 
Fill the space. Leo Simon. John Rabin. Jessica Rabin. Vivian Simon. We miss them. We miss them at celebrations when there's an empty seat at the table. And we miss them when the community gathers and there's an empty place beside us. We miss them today. We miss them every day. We miss them with every year that passes as our life goes on without them. Their faces, their voices, the feel of our arms around them, these are with us forever. For so it is written, love is strong as death. The love that we gave, the love that we received, these endure amid the pain of loss as we miss them. On page 606, in the honor of and in memory of all those names that were lifted up into the space in this room, we say together, Yitkadal Yitkadash Shemei Rabah, Be'alma divarach irute v'yamlich malchute, Be'chayechon uv'yomechon uv'chayei d'chol v'et Yisrael, Ba'agala uv'izman kari v'imru amen. Yehei Shemei Rabah mevarach, Amen. <laughs> Bechayim aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael ve'imru amen. 
Hose shalom bimromav hu yaase shalom aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael ve'al kol yoshvei tevel ve'imru amen. Whether you made your way forward to add a rock to the bowl, or you found yourself at the table lighting a candle, the memories are potent. They're obvious. We have a memorial lit up and in enduring form in the rocks next to us, just like that enduring form of memory holds you as life goes on without them. We're going to conclude with, Osesh, with, oh, with I will remember you. That's right. Will you take a seat, please? I will remember you. Will you remember me? Don't let your life pass you by. Weep not for the so tired I can't sleep standing on the edge of something much too deep it's funny how we feel so much but we cannot say a word we are screaming inside we can't be heard I will We're going to transition now from Yiskur into our closing service of Neila, which will have Havdalah right after that, and then the breakfast. Ah, oh, we're so close. We're so close. We'll take just a moment, and then we'll begin that service. the one that 
that we're doing here? Uh, oh, the, um, the one that I asked you about. Um, so that's my mouth. What's that one? Oh, so my soul may sing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's right up at the okay. top here. So this one. Mm -hmm. If you can get that one up on the screen there, that'd be great. Everything else we have in the book, I think. Yeah, that's should yeah, be good. It's just because I was crying. <laughs> it's contagious. I guess it had gotten worse as long as seen you again. Thank God I haven't seen you since then. Or, or give Jane a call. slideshow together, get into that and sing. What the fuck is that? I can't do it. <laughs> the long day. The long day. I'm on page 612 as we enter this home stretch of Ni'ila. Take a look. The long day is over. And the gates are closing. Slowly look out the window. Day is fading into dusk. Soon the earth will darken. Our bodies weak and weary. Our inner strength, though, undiminished. This day has been a gift. Uncluttered time, free from hurry and routine, from appointments or assignments, this was a time to face our sins and imperfections, our dreams and yearnings, for the life we want to live, a time to leave the clamor of the world and attend to the voice within. Long ago, the temple gates were locked at dusk. So too, at this hour, the gates of Yom Kippur begin to close. Have we done everything that needed to be done? Have we, have we said all that needed to be said? The gates of God's compassion never close, but soon enough, our lives close in on us. And now, in the silence of the soul, now, before this holy day comes to an end, release the unshed tears. Release the deepest prayers that are locked in our hearts. On page 620, we'll feel the difference of change in the energy with this Ni'ila Kaddish. It kadal, the it kadash, shemerata.
shaft of sunlight in the fog, a shift of mind and heart, a breath of peace. Just a moment, that's all I ask, to feel you there, to know your touch, to see the truth behind these words we speak. At the end of this long day, one last chance to stand before you. Exhausted as I am, I still have hope. Just a moment, let me pray. Page 622. If you're able, would you please be upstanding? This day is holy to our God. Do not be sad, for your rejoicing in the Holy One is the source of your strength. Oh, my God. 
Open the gates of righteousness for us. Open the gates that we may enter and praise the, the eternal. Open the gates for us, for all Israel and for people everywhere. The gates of acceptance and atonement, of beauty and creativity. The gates of dignity, empathy and faith. The gates of generosity and hope, insight and joy the gates of knowledge and of love, the gates of meaning and of nobility, the gates of openness, patience, and the quest for peace. Open for us the gates of renewal, song, tranquility. Open the gates of understanding and virtue, the gates of wisdom and wonder, exaltation, youth and old age. Open the gates of Zion, reborn and rebuilt in our time. Open the gates, open them wide, and show us the way to enter. The sun is setting, the gates are closing, the day is through. The sun is setting, the gates are closing, we're here with you. Keep open the gates, keep open the gates for us, keep open the gates at the end of the day. The sun is setting, the gates are closing, the day is through. The sun is setting, the gates are closing, we're here with you. Keep open the Thirty-four. 
You can be settled. On page 636 at the bottom, Vetiten lanu Adonai Elohinu ba'ahava et yom hakipurim haze limchila belesicha ulechapara limcholbo et kol avonotenu mikrai kodesh zecher litziat mitzrayim. In your love, God, you've given us this Yom Kippur, a day on which our wrongs are forgiven, a day of sacred assembly, a day to be mindful of our peoples going out from Egypt. And on page 639, in the middle, God of goodness, mercy, and hope, we're grateful for your gifts of love and compassion. Seal us for a life of integrity, lived in covenant with you. God of peace, grant us peace. Your most precious gift, you've given us freedom to choose between good and evil, between life and death. May we choose life and good that our children may inherit from us the blessing of peace. May we and the whole family of Israel be remembered in the book of life. Blessed is forgiveness, and blessed are goodness, mercy, and love. Blessed is the nearness of divine presence, and blessed is the hope for peace. Baruch Ata Adonai Ose HaShalom. On page 640. Before the gate is locked and shuttered, before every word is said and uttered, before I have become something different, something other, before the mind has lost its way and before possessions are packed and put away, before the pavement hardens here to stay, before the apertures of flutes are sealed, before the laws of nature are revealed, before the vessels break and can't be healed, before decrees and edicts are imposed, before the hand of God has closed, before we rise to leave this place and go. We're going to turn to 644 now, where we will begin the first of three proclamations of the 13 attributes of God. Adonai, Adonai is at the very bottom of the page, and listen to the change in energy as they go. Though we wander and stray, your forgiveness grows as you pardon our wrongs one by one, doing what is right for every living being. 
In your mercy and love, do not treat us harshly for the harshness of our deeds. You teach us to proclaim your attributes, made known to Moses, a man of humility long ago. This day, remember, for our sake, the covenant of your 13 ways. As it is written, the eternal descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed... In case God didn't hear us, Moses prayed to God, As you've been faithful to this people ever since Egypt, please forgive their failings now in keeping with your boundless love. Adonai, Adonai, God doesn't speak Hebrew. <laughs> Adonai, Adonai, God, compassionate, gracious, endlessly patient, loving, and true, showing mercy to the thousandth generation, forgiving evil, defiance, and wrongdoing, granting pardon. On page 648, sometimes when I take people to the mikvah and we're talking about immersing in the tradition of three, I teach that the rabbi said three shows intention. Maybe if you just slipped and fell into the mikvah and immersed, eh, that would be one technically kosher immersion. Let's say you're a klutz and on the way climbing out, shaking your head thinking, gosh, I can't believe how silly I am, you slip and fall back into the mikvah. Oh, there's two. But three... Rest assured, three means I intended it. So here's our third Adonai, Adonai on 648. Forgive us, Avinu, for we have strayed. Pardon us, Malkenu, for succumbing to sin. You're generous in granting forgiveness. All loving to those who reach out to you. Adonai, Adonai. If you've been sitting here for the last days, unsure if you're doing it right on the facing page, may the prayers of those who struggle with prayer reach your presence, God. May the people who say, Shema Yisrael, come to know you as the one who hears. Great giver, Israel's eternal hope, you're rich in forgiveness. And though you dwell on high, your compassion is present here and now. Shelter us in the shade of your presence. 
When you look into our hearts, be kind. Set us on the right path. Come to us, our God. Please, be our strength. Hear the ache in our voices, the pain of our plea. Most high and hidden, we yearn to hear, Salachti kidvarech, I have forgiven. A broken people hungers for your care and protection. Answer us with righteousness. Inspire us with awe. God, be our help. Give us strength. Let's turn to page 650. future has an ancient heart. The tree still stands and your love endures. Remind us we are children still bewildered by the world. Selfish, willful, lacking in patience, longing for praise, in need of hugs. Remind us we're servants. We're day laborers summoned every morning. We're lazy, distractible, focused on quick errands, but we're ennobled by your work. Remind us we are a vineyard, watched over, yearned over, tended these 3,000 years, scorched by fire, but alive at the root, growing slowly towards the harvest day. The future has an ancient heart. The tree still stands and your love endures going to invite you to be upstanding this final set of moments for the, the day on page 652. We are insolent, but you're compassionate and gracious. We are stubborn and stiff-necked, but you, you're slow to anger. We persist in doing wrong, but you are the essence of mercy. Our days are a shadow passing by, but you, you are existence itself. Your years are never ending.
Let's strike a balance between pronouncing our prayers in Hebrew, which a few of you understand very well, most of you do not, do not, and offering them in English, which might feel a little less traditional, but allows us to connect to them a little bit more easily. And so this last Ashamnu on page 653, everybody could take a moment and turn off their cell phones. We're going to pronounce this last Ashamnu one more time, this time in English, because this one's for us. Ball up your fist, put it on your chest, and join me on 653. Of these wrongs, we are guilty. We betray, we steal, we scorn. We act perversely, we are cruel, we scheme, we are violent, we slander, we devise evil, we lie, we ridicule, we disobey, we abuse, we defy, we corrupt, we commit crimes, we are hostile, we are stubborn, we are immoral, we kill, we spoil, we go astray, we lead others astray. Page 654, we can return to our seats. Ata noten yad. You hold out your hand to those who do wrong. Your right hand opens wide to receive those who return. You teach us as the true purpose of confession to turn our hands into instruments of good, to cause no harm or oppression. Receive us, as you promised, in the fullness of our hearts to Shuva. You show us many paths of forgiveness, countless ways to make our lives count. For you know that in the end we will return to the dust of the earth. What are we? What is our life? What is the breadth of our goodness, the depth of our righteousness, the true measure of our achievements and success? What use is our power? What good is our strength? What can we say to you, eternal our God, God of all de the generations? In your presence there are no heroes, and great reputations dissolve. The wise appear unlearned, and the discerning look foolish. For all our deeds amount to futility. All the days of our lives are emptiness. We human beings are no better than beasts. All is vanity. And yet, from the beginning you set us apart, we stand before you uplifted by your unique awareness of humanity. With love you have given us this day of atonement to make an end of moral aimlessness through pardon and forgiveness, to make an end to our abuse of power, to welcome our wholehearted return to the ways of your desire. And you, in your manifold mercy, May you be merciful to us, for the world's destruction is not your desire. As it is said in the prophets, search for eternity while there is time. Cry out when God is near. Let those who do evil give up their ways and the wicked their designs. Let them return to God, who will show them compassion, to our God, whose forgiveness abounds.
A lot of the music on the playlist that we sent out was new to me as well. And I have been listening to that song over and over and over. I've been looking forward to that for some time now. On page 659. We loved and we wept. We were kind and spoke thoughtfully. We were faithful. We were trusting. We put forth effort. We were mindful. We embraced, we took delight in the holy books. We were creative and we yearned. We fought for justice and searched out the good. We tried our best and we were attentive. We did what you commanded us to do. We found meaning in Torah and most of the time we did what was right. We proclaimed your name and we were accepting. We were joyful and we cared. And from on page 661, I think, is this the last time I'm going to ask them to stand? Pretty much. Yeah. Okay, in that case, take a deep breath <laughs> and please be upstanding. From this place of prayer and community, we will soon return to our homes. May we take with us the spirit of this day. Melech chafetz b'chaim. Sovereign God who treasures life, help us turn our homes into havens of your love, into sanctuaries of your compassion. Let them be shelters against the storm. Let them be dwelling places for all that is life-giving and good. And on page 662. Almighty and merciful, welcome our prayer with love, accept and embrace it. Avinu Malkinu, act for the sake of your boundless compassion. Avinu Malkinu, act towards us as befits your name. Avinu Malkinu, seal us in the book of sustenance and livelihood. Avinu Malkinu, seal us in the book of worthiness and merit. Avinu Malkinu, seal us in the book of forgiveness and pardon. Avinu Malkenu, seal us in the book of lives well lived. Avinu Malkenu, seal us in the book of redemption and renewal. Avinu Malkenu, let our hands overflow with your blessings. Avinu Malkenu, let the gates of heaven be open to our prayer. Avinu Malkenu, renew us for a year of goodness. Avinu Malkenu, we have no sovereign but you. Avinu Malkenu, almighty and merciful. Answer us with grace when our deeds are wanting. 
save us through acts of justice and love. Page 666, we needed one more way to articulate our desire that the gates stay open. Se'u she'arim, keep them open, God. Life in its fullness is to stand in awe before an open gate, to gaze into a doorway of hope, a wondrous portal of possibilities. Many are the gates of our lives, many the treasures toward which they lead. And how many close behind us, lost, forgotten, and sealed forever? How many gates, how many years? Standing in awe before the gates of a new year, we see its most precious gift, the minutes and the hours, the days and the weeks, the treasure house of time. Every moment is a vessel of infinite holiness. Every morning, noon, and night is a gateway to life's immensity. How will we use this precious gift? The Kaddish on page 668 is one of those sounds that I look forward to with such incredible enthusiasm, and when it arrives like now, enormous gratitude.
670. We stand as one before the gates of a new year, renewed by this day of atonement, made stronger by all who are with us and by those whose presence we feel within. As the long day fades into dusk, we join our voices in words of hope and dedication. Pit Hulanu Sharait Sedek, Navo Vam Nodeya. Open for us the gates of righteousness that we may enter and praise the eternal source of life. Turn the page. And here we have our finale. A grand finale. Never thought about it in those words before. But it builds, it starts with one and moves to three. And then seven. This is the finale. You've made it. Mazel tov. <laughs> I was pausing. <laughs> Let's all take a deep breath for Cantor. Clearly, that finale was written by someone who's not up in front of a congregation at the end of Yom Kippur delivering uh, those sounds. Yasha Koach, may you be strengthened. Tikia. <laughs> Shavarim Teruah Tekia Gedola
Let's turn to some Havdalah at this point. Let's break ourselves from this space of holiness into what's coming next. You can return to your seats. Are there any kids in the room who can help us with the Havdalah stuff? Uh, Jonah, you want to give me a hand? And Sophie, you too? Ooh. Good evening. 
look good, don't they? <laughs> They're round. We'll give it. Baruch HaTadonai Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotzi Lechem Min HaAretz B'Teh Avon Eshana Tova Umetuka to all of you. Good Yantif. <laughs> Too busy. Too successful. Too stop now.